Funding for the Lazy Bedhead channel was provided by viewers like you. Thank you. Two weeks ago, back in April, a situation was occurring in the Magic the Gathering community. Now, me personally, I don't play Magic. I don't know how the game works or anything about it, but I do have this giant collection of Magic cards from my boyfriend's dad. These might be from like the 90s or something, I don't know, but his dad is a big nerd and gave Alex his Magic set and I just thought it was really cool and I thought I should show you. That shit's metal as fuck. But also, I have played Dungeons and Dragons and since these two things are kind of interconnected, I found out about this story through D&D TikTok that a smaller YouTuber was in some deep shit with the publishers for both D&D and Magic the Gathering, Wizards of the Coast. More specifically, this person was under investigation by the parent company Hasbro. Apparently, this creator, Old School MTG, whose real name is Dan Canyon, with 4,000 subscribers, does unboxing videos on his channel. He opens up new additions and card packs to the game. On April 20th, Dan posted an unboxing of an exclusive collection that Hasbro sent him. This collection, the booster pack of March of the Machine, The Aftermath, was done in a series of videos that were posted to the channel within the course of five days. Well, as it turned out, Dan was not intended to have received this box. It was sent in error. The unboxing video went viral, having the most amount of views on Dan's channel. But like I said, no one was supposed to have seen this collection because he was never supposed to have had it in the first place. Now, normally in a situation like this, a company would omit their mistake. Maybe get in contact with Dan or the people that sold him the box and explain the error. And maybe worst case scenario, they have to lawyer up. Worst case scenario, you know, there's a lawsuit and stuff, but Hasbro is a little bit quirky. They're a little different. Hasbro was gonna rain a new type of hell on this guy. Hasbro thought it appropriate to call the authorities law enforcement. Now, if you thought that was a bit of an overkill, uh, you'd be right, but they didn't just call upon the help of regular law enforcement. They got some private eye. They decided to send over the Pinkertons. Now, I could make a video reading an article, getting angry and call out an overreach of power here, but you know, I'm not gonna do that because I'm not the quartering or mundane Matt. You see, the issue I have with YouTubers that cover this is that they don't really emphasize how bad of a move this was on Hasbro's part. Like, when people hear the name Pinkerton, they usually think of the police force in Red Dead Redemption 2. And although that isn't entirely incorrect, the real story behind this organization is far more interesting. So in order to explain how crazy this move was on Hasbro's behalf, let me give you a brief history lesson, starting with Alan Pinkerton. Our story begins in 1800 Scotland. Scotland forever! Alan J. Pinkerton was born July 21st, 1819 in the Gorbals area of Glasgow. Gorbals was a rural area off the south bank of the River Clyde. The population consisted of migrants attracted to the employment opportunities in Glasgow, and Pinkerton was no different. Alan was the son of William Pinkerton, who was a police detective. However, his father died when Alan was 10 years old, leaving his family in poverty. The loss of the family hierarchy meant that Alan had to leave school to become the main breadwinner for his family. Funnily enough, despite being baptized as a newborn, the Pinkerton family was not religious, and Alan Alan identified himself as an atheist. As part of the working class, Alan worked as child labor as a cooper. A cooper is basically someone that makes barrels. BARRELS! Until being picked up by the Glasgow Chartism Suffrage Association. Or as I like to call it, Glid... Cause... 
So the Chartism movement was one of the first worker class movements of its kind, demanding universal manhood suffrage, equal electoral districts, vote by ballot, annually elected parliaments, payment of members of parliament, and abolishing property requirements to join the movement. Allen was one of the more vocal members of this movement. His strategy as an activist was to use violence to accomplish the goals of the movement. Pinkerton was a man of action over simple protest. He marched down to Newport in 1839 to participate in a demonstration at the Westgate Hotel. The Westgate was used at the time as a stay-in but also served as a jailhouse, specifically for Chartist leadership. Politician and activist John Frost led 3,000 men to rescue five movement leaders who were being held under arrest at the hotel. The 45th Regiment of Foot of Nottinghamshire, or just a very fancy way of saying the National Guard, and the Newport Police would battle with the Chartists using homemade weapons, and the army was armed to the teeth. This left about 10 to 22 estimated Chartists dead, whilst many others were arrested. Due to his participation, Pinkerton was issued a warrant for his arrest after he fled back to Glasgow. In 1842, Alan married Joan Carfrey, who was a singer in Dundingston. When Alan was 23, he fled persecution to the United States, leaving his wife behind in Glasgow. He moved to Dundee Township, Illinois, which was the hub at the time for Scottish immigrants. Pinkerton started a cooperage and sent for his wife to move to America when Pinkerton was done building their log cabin to live in. Since his early life, Alan Pinkerton was an all-work, no-play type of guy. He was a very vocal Scotsman who said it how it was. He never touched alcohol and worked day in and day out to support his simple family life with Joan and their three children. Life was normal after his close call in Glasgow. Alan tried to stay out of politics and any form of activism, but something really interesting would happen to Alan in 1847. It was just a normal day, making barrels, searching around the Fox River Islands for good wood, when Alan stumbled upon a money counterfeit ring. Counterfeit scams were pretty common in the new colonies because, at the time, the expansion of the federal currency laws were still in development. This would hit immigrants pretty hard, because the laws weren't set in stone yet, and they being new to the country, they didn't know how the currency worked. So, they were especially taken advantage of. Pinkerton would stake out this spot for several days to gather all the information he needed to get police involved. Pinkerton and the police raided the camp and confiscated the operation. The police were actually so impressed with Pinkerton's effort to find this camp that they wanted to hire him as part of their police force. Now, initially, Allen wasn't interested in joining the police. I mean, after all, he was wanted in another country for his efforts against the police force. However, busting crime operations seemed to have followed Allen around. The police were investigating yet another string of counterfeit, and having a lack of leads, they turned to Allen Pinkerton, who, although declined to work with the police department before, he decided to take up the mantle on this case as well. You know, since he did so well staking an operation the last time. Not only did Pinkerton identify serial counterfeiter John Craig as the culprit, but he also arranged to meet with John for business, basically setting up a sting operation to catch him in the act. In this sting, Craig was arrested and Pinkerton's reputation was cemented as a counterfeit buster. He still wanted to live the simple life, making barrels with his family. However, the mundane life of breaking his back over barrels was starting to take a toll. Pinkerton wanted something more. He wanted something new. He knew he was capable of so much more than just this. The police believed in his talents and wanted him on the job. So after thinking it over for a while, Pinkerton jumped at the chance to become a deputy. He still did his barrel-making operation on the side, so he worked part-time at his family business, but he was on call when the head sheriff needed him for an investigation. <laughs> The 1850s were a time of conflict. The American working class consisted of new immigrants and slaves from Africa. But mostly slaves from Africa. <laughs> Around this time, a lot of states were banning slavery and were becoming safe places for slaves to live in. The Underground Railroad was a series of safe houses and off-road routes to get slaves either out to a safe state 
or Canada. The Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 signed by Congress required that the slaves be returned to their owners, even if they were in a free state. So Allen, being a passionate abolitionist, used his house as part of this network, despite it being in conflict with not only his police comrades, but the Dundee Baptist Church and his cooperage business suffered from all of this interpersonal tension. In 1859, the Cooks County Sheriff's Office in Chicago reached out to Pinkerton to offer him a position. This was his opportunity to get out of the frontier and into the big city. So he sold his cooperage business, packed up his family, and moved to Chicago. Now, an issue that Allen wanted to tackle when he got to Chicago was how law enforcement agencies could investigate crimes outside of their jurisdiction. You see, a lot of the reason that the counterfeit business was so widespread was because how the police force worked and still kind of works today. It's that anyone with a warrant out for their arrest in one district can jump town and be completely untouchable. This issue, as Alan Pinkerton would come to find during his travels to Chicago, was specifically prominent in the railroad industry, which indiscriminately transferred just about anyone, anywhere, especially criminals with a warrant from another county. So once settled in Chicago, Alan Pinkerton created a private police force to enforce rule on westbound cargo. This is what we know today as the Pinkerton National Detective Agency. This is where the logo of the eye comes from because the agency's motto, we never sleep, wasn't false advertising. Not only did this police force not abide to the boundaries of their jurisdictions, but also they weren't subject to corruption like sheriff offices were. A lot of criminals were easy to buy their way out of trouble through bribing the police force. In fact, John Craig, the criminal that Pinkerton caught in a sting, was actually able to buy his way out of police custody and flee Illinois. The way that the Pinkertons operated back then is how we know the FBI and the CIA operate today, as plainclothes law enforcement that blends into the crowd, that doesn't abide strictly to their district, and works undercover in criminal operations to gather intel. In fact, the Pinkertons would establish the tactics of investigation that would be used by the FBI and the CIA. And a lot of the foundation for how government agencies operate has to give credit to the Pinkerton agency. So the Pinkertons started their operations on the railroad, working beside railroad companies on many different retainer agreements to test railroad workers. So what I mean by testing the railroad workers is basically setting up like mock sting operations, kind of like to catch a predator, but they weren't catching predators, they were honey potting workers to convince them into criminal activity. So basically how this worked is that a Pinkerton agent would go undercover posed as a criminal and they would approach these workers to try to talk them into either breaking company policy or just straight up break the law. Sometimes they would bribe workers to give them either free rides or access to cargo and if they complied with these, bribes, they were reported and fired by the company. This became a business for Alan Pinkerton. He made a ton of money doing this honeypot, way more than his old cooperage business did. And all the funds that he would gain from this business venture were spent investing in his works with the Underground Railroad. Even though he moved from Dundee Township to Chicago, he was still used as a safe haven for the slave transport out to Canada. And because Allen was established as his own police enforcement, there didn't come the backlash from his county agency since he was a no strings detective. So he just kind of operated on his own department by himself. His work on the Underground Railroad thrusted Allen into activist work once again, this time working to raise money for wanted abolitionist John Brown. His abolitionist ideals and assistance would reach the masses, as well as the abolitionist lawyer, Abraham Lincoln. Abraham and Allen met when they worked on behalf of the Illinois Central Railroad. At the time, Lincoln was a lawyer who would offer legal advice to the Pinkertons. So even though he was operating on his own, Allen understood the law well enough thanks to the help of Lincoln to stay out of the legal limelight. When Abe was running for president, Pinkerton's agency was the largest in the country and the Civil War only helped expand it. The Pinkerton Agency would station within Confederate state lines to provide insiders intel for the Union. Pinkerton was also responsible for many Confederate busts and raids on their camps. 
Allen himself was even responsible for the personal arrest that he made on Confederate spy Rose O'Neill Greenhouse. To understand how significant this arrest was and how important Rose was to the Confederacy, her work as an undercover agent for the Confederacy helped retrieve intel on battle plans of the Union, which created a stronghold for the Confederate Army in the First Battle of Bull Run. One of these Union generals that put his trust in Allen with war strategy was General George McLean. McLean was the general that established the Union Army's first intelligence agency with the Pinkertons. He would use this intelligence organization not only to provide bodyguards to Union politicians, but also to spy on both abolitionist and Confederate leaders. George had hired Allen to spy on their own because of a growing mistrust between himself and Abe Lincoln. George would often ignore Lincoln's orders and refuse to share battle plans. This conflict put Pinkerton in the middle of these two, but Lincoln's final straw came at the Battle of Antium. Not only did George fail to defeat Robert E. Lee's army assault, but he also failed to relay battle tactics to his constituency. Lincoln removed George from his command position, but kept Alan Pinkerton and his agency. And Lincoln's dependency on the Pinkerton team would prove to save his life. Abraham Lincoln became the 16th president of the United States on March 4, 1861. What you might not have known was that days before the inauguration, there was an assassination plot on Abe's life that would be thwarted by Alan Pinkerton and his team. Although I can't entirely say that Alan deserved all the credit. Alan assigned a female Pinkerton detective to the job, a woman by the name of Kate Warren. Kate not only went undercover and discovered the assassination plot, but she also thought of a plan to foil it. You see, the conspiracy to assassinate the president would have happened on his train route to the inauguration. So Kate thought of an idea to disguise Lincoln as her incompetent brother to a separate train route to Baltimore. They even went so far to disguise Lincoln with a shawl and a beaver hat and hunch him over so that he looked unrecognizable. They were so cautious with getting Lincoln there that instead of him arriving in a horse-pulled carriage like the assassins anticipated, they took the railway car that he was in and pulled it with horses. Alan was so impressed by Kate's efforts and her heroism to protect the president that when she died of pneumonia, he buried her in his family lot. Needless to say, if the founder of the organization himself thought her something special, then she shouldn't be forgotten in our history. She succeeded far beyond my utmost expectations, and I soon found her an invaluable acquisition to my force. She was a brilliant conversationalist when so disposed, and could be quite vivacious, but also understood that rarer quality in womankind, the art of being silent. So after Allen's death, the Pinkerton organization took up a new line of work. Most of their agency's specialty was being like an undercover guardsman for capitalist companies. Meaning, if there was ever a threat to those owners, whether that be their business or their life, they would defend it. Usually with violence. And the threat that was most common for capitalists were unions. This is what the Pinkertons became pretty well known for. They became the union-busting thugs that are hired by larger companies to break these unions apart. They basically became the most hated group by union workers, and the middle class especially. But they were also the most feared, because like I said, they operated without respecting jurisdiction or needing to show a badge and they were armed to the teeth with rifles. So they were basically a private army to the upper class that paid them to get rid of unruliness in the working force. However, on July 6, 1892, the Union would finally give the Pinkertons a taste of their own medicine. On this day in Homestead, Pennsylvania, a protest against the Homestead Steelwork gathered in the early hours. These were known as the Homestead Strikes. The Strikers main goal was one thing, and that was that the company could not cut their wages. The Carnegie Steel Company was one of the largest steel innovations in the United States. 
Established in the late 1800s, this company was responsible for the construction of structural beams and plates for the U.S. Navy, and this would be the first of its kind as well, as Carnegie had the most steelwork contracts signed than any other business. There was just one problem. The working conditions were shit. <laughs> Whilst the company was becoming one of the most profitable in the country, the working force was getting a cut to their wages, despite the company making more money than ever. Instead of increasing workers' pay, they were cutting into their payroll. This was because they needed more funds to hire more people instead of just increasing the pay of the workers that have already been there. Sound familiar? Anyone? Well, that's because this still happens even today. I guess they never learn. <laughs> so the Amalgamated Association of Iron and Steel Workers, which is a long ass, but a bomb ass name for a union, was established in 1876. It was a craft union specifically for iron and steel workers. The union assisted the working class in the iron and steel business by mediating a national uniform wage scales on a yearly basis. They also helped balance working hours as well as relieve workload levels and work speeds. And just overall, demanding better working conditions for their employment. Because, well, they're in the steel and iron industry, it's not a safe career. So they demanded at least safety protocols and training for their staff. Now, all of this kind of sounds like standard practice today, but a lot of companies back then were making cuts in their budget for safety and work maintenance. And just workers pay overall and this got the attention of the union now what was different about these strikes conducted by the aa was that most uprisings in the past like the great railroad strikes were largely unorganized but with this they were already established as a workers union dedicated to help organize steel workers collectively together all across the country so the founder of the carnegie steel company Andrew Carnegie agreed to negotiate with the AA. Andrew was publicly in favor of labor unions, whilst his co-founder, Henry Clay Frick, was not in support of unions. Carnegie and Frick met with the local leaders of the AA union and entered into negotiations in February. The union argued that the steel industry was doing well, and with inflation, prices for the standards of living were increasing. The AA's request was simple. In order to keep up with the rising cost of living, there would have to be a wage increase. Frick immediately countered this offer with a 22% wage decrease. This would affect half of the current working force that they had under them. And Carnegie was just over here like, dude, we're trying to get them off of our backs. This is going to do the total opposite of that. And Frick was like, okay, well, you know what? I'll just expand these negotiations for another month. But if these guys can't reach an agreement that I like, I'm not even going to recognize them as a union anymore. As you can imagine, that response went as well as you could expect. The workers began to rise up, and in retaliation for not keeping their word to keep communications open, Frick locked the workers out of the rest of the plant. Henry's intended goal at that point was to hire discriminately against union workers and only hire non-union work. This meant that a lot of people who were on strike were being replaced until the entire steel plant was replaced by non-union work. The workers determined to keep their positions and make prick, I mean, frick, pay, locked everything down. The factory was non-operational and was closed out for any work. Frick and Carnegie were losing days of production and workers that they just hired to replace the striking ones. With this forced closure, in a desperate attempt to finally end the strikes, they hired the Pinkertons, who showed up armed and ready on July 6, 1892. 300 men of the Pinkerton Detective Agency arrived on boats, but this time, the workers were ready to fight back with everything they got. Whilst the Pinkertons immediately responded with open fire, the workers responded with rocks, burning oil, burning railway cars, and a big fuck-off cannon. This was what was known as the Homestead Massacre, with three Pinkerton agents killed and the remaining 297 injured from either the fighting or the walk of shame. See, the Pinkertons had to report back to their clients that they have surrendered to the union strike. 
For the first time ever, the Pinkertons could not bust a union and had to walk through that same crowd that they tried to strike down. The workers beat and berated them as they were forced to retreat back to their boats. In 1893, the U.S. Congress would pass the Anti-Pinkerton Act. Yeah, these guys were so notorious that they got the attention of Congress. And they decided to do something about it. It basically limited the government's ability to hire private eyes and mercenaries. And although this wouldn't necessarily apply to private companies who still had access to hire the Pinkertons, what it did effectively do was give the federal government oversight over all of their operations. And because most of their clients didn't want the government overlooking their personal business dealings, the Pinkertons would be hired less and less, with this constant tether on them at all times. And with organizations establishing after, like the CIA and the FBI, the Pinkertons would just kind of fade into obscurity. Or did they? Pinkerton, which still runs as a private security guard and a detective agency, resides as a subsidiary of Swedish-based Securitas AB, which is a security contractor from Stockholm. So, Basically, the Pinkertons work as a sister company to Securitas. Their current operations are actually in Ann Arbor, Michigan. They have a whole Google review page and everything. So let's see what people have to say about them. Justice for old school MTG. Workplace violence training is included in their provided services. That's a funny way of saying union busting and assassination. It's rather interesting that their, our history section, on their website, is missing some rather important information. How does Pinkerton even operate? They owe other companies more money than they make annually. For employment standards, they are also racist and sexist. Do not conduct business with any Pinkerton offices. The worst service imaginable. We had to submit three background checks for each of our employees to be told later that they couldn't locate them. We had to send a screenshot of the confirmation just for them to locate the background checks. I have never written until now. This company is money grab hungry and can hardly be trusted. You're taking a large risk using this risk management company. So yeah. It's not great. They also have a website where they talk about their ties to protecting Abe Lincoln from an attempted assassination and how they combine their 170 years of legacy and institutional knowledge with technology informed by our expertise to protect and create value for our clients across the globe. But there is a real looming question here that was asked with the customer reviews. If the Pinkertons own more than they actually make, then how the hell are they even still a thing? Well, you see, their parent company has some role in that. Securitas actually bought out the Pinkerton company for $384 million. Securitas partnered with the William J. Burns Detective Agency, which was a longtime Pinkerton rival, to create Securitas Security Services USA. So, Technically speaking, when companies hire the Pinkertons today, they're not hiring through the Pinkertons specifically. They are hiring service members of Securitas. The Pinkertons only act in contract with the Securitas agency. So technically speaking, they're not even Pinkertons. They're security guards under this Swedish company. They only really exist today as well as the Burns agency through this parent company that uses their employees as their workforce. Not only are they bought out and operating today, but they are still getting work and they are still busting unions. So in 2020, just three years ago, the Pankertons were hired by Amazon to spy on their warehouse workers. That's right, the things that they were doing all those years ago to railroad workers to try and take their unions out with honey potting yeah they're continuing to do that even into current year it was also revealed in 2022 that starbucks even hired the pinkertons when that countrywide strike was happening yeah well first of all i just want to make sure everyone knows about pinkerton mm -hmm. so they were founded in 1850 as basically a detective agency and they're somewhat notorious as they should be for spying on workers um being acting as goons being strike breakers even actually participating in, in things that are considered massacres but uh 
So now everyone knows who Pinkertons is. And then the CIA, you obviously know the CIA is. <laughs> but like, you kind of can't make this up. I mean, like, I don't know what's more pathetic, that Starbucks has to hire CIA to like smash baristas or yeah. that an ex-CIA has nothing better to do with her time than to smash baristas. And yeah, but they have a lot of money to pay the ex-CIA. That is official. true. That is true, yeah. And like, Howard Schultz is worth $40 billion and he's calling in the CIA it's not to enough. stop unionization. Like, he should call in the guys who went after, like, Bin Laden next. And if you think that they were done being violent in their efforts, listen to this. In 2020, a man by the name of Matthew Doloff shot and killed conservative protester Lee Keltner. That protest in 2020 involved this man, Lee Keltner. He was attending a protest when a confrontation happened with an armed security guard who was hired by a local TV station. Keltner was sprayed with an orange dispersant. Well, that guard, Matthew Doloff, fired a gun. Doloff was facing murder charges in Keltner's death. Well, today, the district attorney dropped those charges. Well, Karen, it happened right here between the Central Library and the Art Museum. And now, a year and a half later, the DA's office has told the judge it is dropping the charges because it does not feel it can win the case. Appearing very different from the time of the shooting, the moment that Matthew Doloff had wanted arrived. So I'm asking the court to dismiss this case without prejudice. Doloff had claimed self-defense since the October 2020 incident. Security personnel in camouflage had just filed out of a Patriot rally. But one of those attending, Lee Keltner, stayed behind and got involved in an argument. A moment later, a burst of orange smoke and a gunshot. So this happened in Denver, Colorado, and a lot of conservative talking heads and other right-wing outlets would try to twist this story and say that this was an Antifa attack, that Antifa was a terrorist organization that killed an innocent patriot protesting. However, there are some key points of interest that these media outlets just conveniently leave out. For instance, there is this video evidence that shows that Keltner attacked first by not only slapping Matthew, so assault, but then he proceeded to spray him with bear spray. And this was all before Matthew pulled out a gun and shot him. Now, it was reported that Matthew worked as private security for Channel 9 News. He was basically sent in with Channel 9 News to cover clashes between liberal and conservative protesters. Well, what was later revealed after Matthew's charges were dropped and his claim to self-defense held up in court was that Matthew was unlicensed as a security guard. And the reason why was because he was contracted through the Pinkertons. And part of this issue has to do with the Pinkerton agency having one, piss poor hiring processes, but also how the law works in Colorado. Colorado is one of nine states that do not regulate security guards or security companies, meaning there are no statewide training or hiring standards for the thousands of people who work in these quasi law enforcement roles guarding buildings and people across the state. Even when security guards are armed, they are not required by the state to have any qualifications beyond what allows them to carry the weapon as a citizen. So the Pinkertons are able to operate unsupervised and hire whoever they want without background checks into their history or whether their hired work is licensed in what they're being employed to do. And now we have this new situation with Wizards of the Coast, where Hasbro has put out this statement saying that the Pinkertons were involved but they only resorted to getting them involved after attempting to contact Dan, but he was unresponsive to emails. But what is so weird about this is that according to Dan, he was actually able to get contact information to a representative at Wizards of the Coast, but he was only able to get this contact after the Pinkertons showed up. The representative that he spoke to was apparently very apologetic about it resorting to this, and that Hasbro didn't believe that Dan stole anything, which he didn't steal anything, he received the cards in error. But if they were so adamant to think that this guy wasn't a thief and that this was some sort of mistake, then why did they send the Pinkertons of all people? And the answer to that is 
it's more common than you think. There have been reports as early as 2021 of private detectives being hired on companies' behalves to receive stolen property. Those reports that I mentioned were in regards to stolen Pokemon cards that were actually stolen straight from the printing press and posted to Facebook and Reddit. Now, the Pinkertons took everything from this guy and he agreed to take his videos down. Dan also advises in this video addressing everything that happened that unless you want the Pinkertons at your door, it'd be best not to re-upload that footage, hence why I can't use any here. But what's the takeaway in all this? Why did I just give you this long history lesson and current events of a sketchy security operation? Well... So there's a couple of things that we have to establish when we're talking about the impact of the Pinkerton organization and how they are viewed today in the modern era. It is important to understand that with the history of the Pinkertons, they did once stood for something. They stood for something more than just being a union-busting group that protects capitalism. I mean, the root for both of those things were technically already ingrained in the company with testing railroad workers and stuff like that. They have historical importance with protecting very important people in power. And if it wasn't for their efforts, Abraham Lincoln would have never been our 16th president at all. And reminder that we have a woman to thank for that. You know, because whitewashed male-dominated history is like my least favorite thing. <laughs> Plus, the union busting stuff happened after Alan Pinkerton died, and he was once part of a union back in Scotland, so surely if he were to see how his operation was viewed today, then he wouldn't approve of what his organization is doing now. Right? Ah, uh, well, I uh, see. The thing is... No. <laughs> like I mentioned before, there were already anti-union sentiments instilled in the foundation of the Pinkerton Agency, especially with them honeypotting the railroad workers. But if you want a better example of their attitude towards unions, especially during Alan's time, you can just look into his writings. Even though Alan Pinkerton was part of the Chartism movement, he himself being subjugated to inhumane treatment in the labor force, and a victim of child labor in Scotland. In America, he didn't have the same sympathy. He wrote that in 1878 that the American worker was negatively affected by the influence of foreign political ideologies, such as anarchism and socialism. Pinkerton would go on to say that the true American worker's spirit and their honest labor was being destroyed by these mock protests that don't serve to reward their hard work, rather benefit only themselves. Which is like... No. <laughs> Keep this in mind that during the Homestead Riots, the only thing that protesters were demanding was that their pay wages were left untouched. That's it. And at the time, most operations in America were plagued with horrible and dangerous working conditions that cut the lifespan of an American worker down to their 30s and their 40s. Kids were working at the ages of like nine in dangerous environments, and so many people were killed on the job, it was almost like an expected risk to send your husband or son to work. And despite all of that, <laughs> The only thing that they were demanding was that they keep the pay wages the way that they were. <laughs> Regardless, I think Alan's story is a lesson that can be applied to all of us, fighting for a more fair society that values the working class instead of just undermines us and only values the top 1%. The majority of America's wealth and money is owned by the top 1% of the population. That's about like a hundred people owning more money than anyone could ever imagine and millions either living paycheck to paycheck or completely in debt and broke beyond repair. Like, these people are gonna be paying all of their debts after they are dead. Like, that's how broke they are. And maybe in Alan Pinkerton's time, the mentality of if you can't beat them, join them might have been more possible to achieve. But not in this day and age where systemic oppression, monopolies, company overreach in our government. So we can't just abandon our principles and join the wealthy class on a whim like Alan did. We have to try so much harder. And sometimes no matter how hard you try, there are still systems in place 
built specifically to keep you where you're at. But if there is a more hopeful lesson to be had in all of this, is that if large companies have to go out of their way to hire thugs like the Pinkertons to cause disruption and disarray in the working class, then that means whatever we're doing is working. It is scaring these large entities enough that they have to result to violence with agencies like the Pinkertons to shut us up. But it won't work. I can promise you that. Now, what usually works more oftentimes than not is having a president that claims to be pro-working class and pro-union, but then completely go back on his word and break apart the railroad strikes that were happening. Usually that does it. And listen, as influential as the Pinkertons were way back then, they don't have that same influence now. In fact, that influence is all they have left. And that's ancient history now. The Pinkertons aren't known for protecting Abe Lincoln. They aren't known for their efforts against the Confederacy in the Civil War. They're known as the protectors of the highest bidder. And more often times than not, the highest bidder is the successful capitalist and not the workers underneath a capitalist system. And it's just kind of sad because even though their efforts are admirable in some aspects, they're just thugs by the end of the day. No matter how you look at it, no matter what historical importance they had before, that's all gone now. Because in current year, they decided to scare the shit out of a Magic the Gathering YouTuber and his wife over fucking magic cards. Like, dude, that is the biggest glow down ever in US history. What the fuck? Oh, but don't you worry. If all of that pro-union talk scared you, then I would like to remind you that here at the Lazy Bedhead Show, it's not about pushing an agenda or starting social change or preaching to the masses. It's all about making that YouTube ad revenue, baby. Because if you can't beat them, join them with the profits of the masses. So why not help my narcissistic journey into insanity by supporting me on Patreon? Because hypocrisy goes down smoother with a shot of whiskey and a good conservative own. But Lazy, what would we get if we subscribe to your Patreon? Well, if you donate just one singular dollar, I don't know, I'll cook you dinner or something. Here at Lazy's Kitchen, we're starting off with a nice side of Rachel, followed up with a side of Pineapple Foster as a side of mixed fruits. For the main dishes, we have the one and only Phineas, a local specialty served with our meats, Bryce Cox. For drinks, we have a choice between our two specialty cocktails, the Star M if you want something more sweet, and the Gwendolyn Von Holt if you want a more gothic wine. And for dessert, we have the choices between our Wendy's special, but if you want a chef recommendation, I would highly suggest the Honey Fond with its sweet honey chocolate flavors. Come wine and dine with us today at Lazy's Kitchen, only on Patreon. Subscribe and let me eat you. The end.